Hey guys, so lately I've been compiling crazy stories that occurred during the days of the ABA's lifetime, from 1967 to 76, but instead of tying them into some big video, I decided why not just read off some of these stories for a whole video. These are some of the funniest and craziest basketball stories I've ever heard. This is Reggie Harding. Harding was a 7 foot center who played 4 seasons in the NBA, and honestly, he could get a whole video dedicated to his antics alone. To put it simply, this guy was crazy. <laughs> He was suspended by the NBA in 1966 for off-the-court issues, and he jumped leagues in the middle of the 1968 season. Harding played 25 games for the Indiana Pacers. He missed practices, he would be late to team flights, and one time, he said he missed practice because he had to go to his daughter's funeral, even though he never had a daughter. Teammates have said that Harding creeped them out. This specific story concerns Harding and his Pacers teammate, Jimmy Rail. Rail was a 6'2 point guard from Indiana and his nickname was Tweety Bird. He was rooming with Harding when the team was down in New Orleans, and according to Rail, he woke up in the middle of the night to find Harding pointing a gun in his face. Harding then said, Tweety Bird, I hear you hate. Rail told him he didn't, and had to talk his way out of getting shot. Somehow, he got Harding to hand over the gun, and then quickly removed all of the ammo. Rail turned out the light again to try and get some sleep, but only a few minutes later, he turned the light back on to find Harding pointing the gun at him again. You didn't think I only had six shells, did you? Harding said. Rail walked out of the room and stayed in the hotel lobby all night. In the Pacers game the very next day, Rail shot 1 for 14 from the field. Mel Daniels had a passion for horse riding. He purchased a farm outside of Indianapolis and would sometimes come to practice covered in mud and dust due to horse riding. Daniels eventually recruited Roger Brown and George McGinnis to join his cowboy crew. The three would come into the Pacers locker room dressed as cowboys, with hats, boots, and even holsters with real guns. They would bring these weapons into the locker room and just point them at each other for fun. Yeah, it was all fun and games, until one of the guns actually went off in the locker room. Thankfully, no one was hurt. This is Art Heyman. During the 1968 Finals, where Heyman's Pittsburgh Pipers were playing against the New Orleans Buccaneers, a New Orleans fan spit on Heyman, so Art punched the heck out of him. Heyman was subsequently arrested by the New Orleans police in the middle of the Finals. Well, here's the deal. The fan really did spit on Heyman, but it wasn't intentional. The fan had a physical condition, so when Heyman realized that, he apologized and all the charges were dropped. In 1970, one of the eight owners of the Pittsburgh Pipers decided to trade Heyman to the Miami Floridians. But here's the thing, the anonymous owner barely told anyone that Heyman was getting traded. So when Heyman arrived in Miami, the Floridians front office had no idea what Heyman was even doing there. Bob Halloran, who was a sportscaster for TV4 in Miami at the time, happened to spot Heyman and decided to interview him. Heyman asked Bob, does this go out to Miami Beach? When Bob told him yes, Heyman responded by saying this. Hello Jews out there, your boy is here. Fly Williams was a 6 foot 5 shooting guard who played one season for the Spirits of St. Louis in 1975. He was very skinny due to bad eating habits as a child and due to the fact that in his adult life he was missing a lot of teeth. The executive of the Spirits, Harry Weltman, sent Fly to the dentist in order for him to get some teeth. As Fly sat in the dentist chair, the dentist pulled out a big needle for a Novocaine shot. Fly immediately ran out of the dentist's office. When Harry Weltman caught wind of what happened, he called Fly and asked, What's going on? You've gotta have some teeth. Fly responded by saying, Man, I wouldn't be the Fly if I had teeth. This is John Brisker. He played in the ABA for three seasons and was a two-time All-Star before joining the Seattle Supersonics in the NBA. Brisker is probably most famous for the mysterious circumstances around his death, which involves diamonds, Idi Amin, and Uganda. A lot of people have made videos on that topic, so I won't do that here. In his ABA days, Brisker had a reputation as one of, if not the scariest guy in the league. According to his Condors teammate Charlie Williams, 
He was an excellent player, but say something wrong to the guy, and you had this feeling he would reach into his bag, take out a gun, and shoot you. Brisker's nickname was actually the heavyweight champion of the ABA, and he got ejected from games quite a bit. During a training camp, Pittsburgh actually hired an ex-football player to practice with the team, and if Brisker started acting out, the football player was deliberately supposed to beat him up. Well, as it turns out, Brisker and the guy started fighting, and the football player said, the heck with you, I'm gonna get my gun. Brisker said, if you're getting a gun, then I'm gonna get my gun. The two men then ran off the court in different directions. Safe to say, the coaches quickly called off practice. In 1972, the Dallas Chaparrals, who were currently on a nine-game losing streak, were in Pittsburgh to play against Brisker's Condors. Dallas coach Tom Nasalki wanted to end their losing streak, so he told his team in the locker room, the first guy in this room who decks Brisker will get $500. A Dallas bench guy named Lenny Chappell asked if he could start the game, and during the opening jump ball, Chappell punched Brisker square in the face and knocked him to the ground. From that point on, Nasalki had a $500 bounty on Brisker's head every time they would play him. Warren Armstrong, who later changed his name to Warren Jabali, is also remembered as one of the scariest guys from the ABA. He was a 6 foot 2 point slash shooting guard, who was a 4 time all star, the 1969 rookie of the year, and he was also a 1969 champion. Jabali was famous for his strong and outspoken pro black and pro Muslim beliefs. He was once suspended for 15 games for stomping on the head of a guy who was on the ground. There's also a famous story of the time Jabali was in the locker room, and he noticed that a black rookie on his team was wearing cotton underwear. Jabali was so angry, he literally ripped the underwear off the kid and yelled, Don't you know that our ancestors had to pick this cotton? Get yourself some slick draws. This is David Vaughn. He was a 6'11 center who played two seasons for the Virginia Squires. There's two interesting stories when it comes to Vaughn that happened in two consecutive days. One day, Vaughn walked outside of his house in Virginia Beach wearing only a t-shirt, which led to him getting arrested for indecent exposure. And apparently, Vaughn told the arresting officers, God is naked too. The very next day, Vaughn was filling up his rental car at a shell station in Great Bridge, Virginia, but he drove away without paying for the $14 worth of gasoline. Vaughn ended up in a high-speed chase with three police cars. The police said that the upper part of Vaughn's body could be seen through the sunroof during much of the chase. Vaughn rammed into three police cars and the automobile of a woman. When the police finally blocked his car, there was a struggle to pull Vaughn out of the car, and in the process, Vaughn was shot by a Chesapeake policewoman who had only been on the force for a month. The ABA struggled with financial issues throughout its lifetime. Teams did not actually provide food to their players. Instead, they just told them to brown bag meals. When an ABA team went on the road, they also couldn't bring their team trainer with them. So it was the home team's responsibility to provide a trainer for the away team. Larry Brown claims that for an away game against the Denver Rockets, the trainer that was provided for him taped up his ankle so tight that he actually started bleeding. Brown went into the shower to cut the tape off. When he saw that his teammates were doing the exact same thing. Brown decided to confront the trainer and ask him what his real job was. The man hesitated for a moment and then said, well, I'm a poultry farmer. The ABA is of course remembered for introducing the three-point line, but the league also had two more unique rules. For one, the shot clock was 30 seconds, as opposed to the NBA's 24 seconds. Also, ABA players could not foul out of games. If a player accumulated six fouls, they could stay in the game, but every foul committed after that resulted in free throws and possession given to the opposing team. From 1971 to 1975, there were expedition games held between the ABA and the NBA in September and October before each regular season. In one half of the game, the ABA's red, white, and blue ball was used, as well as the three-point line and 30-second shot clock. For certain games, the no foul out rule was also in place. Overall, the ABA won 79 of the games, while the NBA won 76. The games reportedly got pretty intense. One time, the Celtics' Dave Cowens was ejected for punting a basketball, and Celtics coach Tom Heinsohn was given seven technical fouls, as well as an ejection. 
Johnny Newman was a 6'6 shooting guard slash small forward who spent most of his ABA career playing in Memphis. One night, when he was sitting on the bench, his coach called his name to sub him in the game. Newman stood up and tore off his warm-up pants, but all he was wearing underneath was his jock strap. One of Newman's favorite phrases was apparently, paper means nothing to me. Newman lived a pretty rock and roll lifestyle. He bought a sports car in Indianapolis while the Memphis team was in town for a game, and then he had to find someone to drive the car home. In his second year, he owned seven cars, including a Ferrari, a Jaguar, a Harley Davidson motorcycle, and a stock car with his name on it. Newman would also say things like, to be honest, I was the biggest thing to ever come out of Memphis, other than Elvis. Newman later went through a divorce with his wife, but he found a new girlfriend in Salt Lake City. Between giving his ex-wife his Jaguar, the Memphis house, and the constant flights he had to take between Utah and Memphis, Newman was losing a lot of money. So one day, he walked into the Memphis dressing room and tried auctioning off his Ferrari and Harley. That's all I have for today. Do you think I missed any famous stories? Would you like to see a part two to this video? Let me know in the comments. Alright, take care.